uh, 222, excuse me, this today is Lesson 223 as we're going to continue kind of uh, looking at some things related to the early response and reception to the King James when it was first published in 1611. So everybody should have introduction at the top and let's get started with the first bullet point. In Lesson 222, 222 we resume looking at the AV of 1611 as a historical artifact by considering its early reception. In addition, I laid out that we would also be considering the following additional items. We're going to be talking about early criticism that the AV received, as well as early sales after it was first published and made available to the public to buy. So those are two topics that we're still going to be looking at yet, part today and then moving on into the future. We concluded the previous lesson with the following citation from the pen of Dr. Mordecai Feingold, editor of Laborers in the Vineyard of the Lord, Scholarship in the Making of the King James Version of the Bible. Now, full transparency, this was in the notes, but if you recall from last Sunday, we were very pressed for time because we had some tech problems and I got started late. So I didn't actually read this quote in the video recording uh, for the last lesson, so I definitely want to make sure that we read it here today. So... Feingold says the following quote, and to reiterate, while many of the brethren remained attached to the dogmatic doctrinal annotation, I think that should say annotations, of the Geneva Bible, few faulted the translation itself. So let's stop right there. So we kind of talked about this last time. When the King James first came out, it was really, the people that stuck with the Geneva really had more of an attachment to the annotations and the marginal notes, etc. in the Geneva Bible than they did a, a translational objection to the King James Bible. So in other words, it's not like they thought that the King James Bible was a bad translation as much as they liked the marginal notes of the Geneva Bible, which is why, and I was just looking at this this week, there's at least... Beginning in 1640, there's at least four different editions of the King James Bible published with the Geneva notes in the margins. Uh, there was a demand for that, and so the publishers wanting to make money, were they willing to supply that mar the market with that what was being demanded? Okay, so let's start the quote over again. And to, and to reiterate, while many of the brethren remain attached to the dogmatic doctrinal annotations of the Geneva Bible, few fault of the translation itself. Grumblings regarding the King James arose over specific renderings of a word or a phrase, not over the translation as a whole. So in other words, some people might have preferred a certain thing be translated one way as opposed to another way, but there was not universal grumbling over the whole, the, in total, the entire translation, okay? Only one individual, Hugh Broughton, denounced it, uh, tote court, or that's Latin for, with no addition or qualification. So in other words, was Broughton totally against it? Yes. Yeah, he is absolutely totally against it. He hated it. He detested it. We'll be looking at why that is here as we get started, Okay. But then he was deeply offended for, for having been excluded from among the rank of the translators. So Broughton is a disgruntled person who fancied himself a translator and thought he should have been included, but wasn't. He is the, most, he is the chief, most vocal critic of the AV after it was first published in 1611. And as we'll see this morning, it is largely due to the fact that he was left off and not included in the translational committees. Okay, so he has like a personal axe to grind against the project. He also took umbrage because the translators had refused to incorporate his prophetically grounded emendations into the KJV. So, Broughton is personally offended by what is going on here, and we'll be looking at some of the reasons why. In this lesson, we want to consider the topic of early criticism by looking at the objections of Hugh Broughton to the authorized version. The person of Hugh Broughton has already been discussed in this class. In Lesson 157, which was titled Pre-Jamesian Calls for a New Translation, we discuss Hugh Broughton's crusade in the late 1580s and 1590s for a new English Bible in some detail. So we looked at that in Lesson 157. In addition, in Lesson 198, we briefly mentioned Broughton when discussing subsection 11 of the preface titled A Satisfaction of Our Brethren as a person that Miles Smith was potentially addressing. Okay, um, 
We need to check that. I'm not sure that word stratification is right. I think it should say satisfaction. So we'll have to check that word. Recall that Broughton had been passed over by Archbishop Richard Bancroft as a translator to work on the King James Translation Project. Satisfaction is correct. So we need to change it, right? Okay. Thank you for checking. Moreover, we saw in our study of Miles Smith's preface that he anticipated. So Miles Smith, when he wrote the preface to the AV, he anticipated a hostile reception for the work, their work. Indeed, the first two subsections of the preface are about calumniation or slander. Later in the preface, Smith opened subsection 9 titled, The Speeches and Reasons Both of Our Brother and of Our Adversaries Against This Work, with the following line. Men's, many men's mouths have been opened a good while and yet are not stopped with speeches about the translation so long in hand or rather perusals of translations made before. So, was Miles Smith aware of the fact that there were people who were saying critical things about the translation before it was published? Yeah. All right? And does he anticipate that it will receive to some degree a hostile reception? By some, not all, but by some. Okay? Page 2. Regarding this, Dr. David Norton, author of the History of the English Bible as Literature, writes, quote, If there was a general storm such as they anticipated, almost all direct evidence of it has disappeared. Yet had not Hugh Broughton carried out his determination to censure the new translation, it might seem that the King James Bible fell into a vacuum. Now, we addressed some of Norton's comments last week in Lesson 222. So look at the next point. While I do not agree with all of Dr. Norton's thinking regarding the early reception of the AV, see Lesson 222, his thoughts regarding Broughton's early criticisms are highly relevant to the topic of this lesson. Shortly after the publication of the AV, either in late 1611 or early 1612, Broughton published a piece titled, this is the name of it, a censure of the late translation uh, for our church is sent unto the rightful, worshipful knight attendant upon the king. As the title suggests, this work outlined ten main objections to the new Bible. Dr. Norton, ten main objections to the new Bible. Dr. Norton states, should say, I believe, the following. Dr. Norton states the following regarding Broughton's censure of the AV. So we need to add the phrase, the following there into that sentence. This is what he said, quote, his response, a censure to the late translation for the churches sent unto a right worshipful knight attendant upon the king, was written either in 1611 or 1612, he died in 1612, Broughton did, and begins, quote, the late Bible, this is what he says, this is the opening line of this work, by the way, that there's a link to this in the digital copy of the notes, you can go read the century yourself if you want to, the late Bible, right worshipful, was sent me to censure, which bred in me a sadness that will grieve me while I breathe. It is so ill done. Tell his majesty that I had rather be rent in pieces with wild horses than any such translation by my consent should be urged upon poor churches. To which I would say, dramatic much? <laughs> okay. He'd rather be rent in pieces to my wild horses than to have anybody read this Bible. So, Broughton is something of a malcontent, okay? He's an ornery, not nice guy, and he is not well-liked, and he's not somebody that could be uh, easily worked with on a project. Moving on with the quote. Broughton's objections, of which he lists ten, show as one would, accept, one would expect that the King James Bible did indeed receive the minute caviling, that's the term that uh, Miles Smith used in the preface. Cavaling attention that Miles Smith had feared. The most colorful is the second objection, uh, which is to Jesus being called the Son of God in Luke 3. So he's mad about the King James Bible calling Jesus the Son of God in Luke 3. This is one of his major objections in his censure. He says, regarding this, in 15 verses, ring 15 core idle words for uh, uh, accounts in the day of judgment. So in other words, these people are going to be judged for the way they rendered this, according to Broughton. And bring Joseph to be the son of all men there, 
where thus saying Luke meant Jesus was called of my fa of the father my son being son of Joseph as men thought a Jew of Amsterdam objected to the bishop's error to deny the New Testament that omitted how Christ should come of David thereupon I cleared our Lord's family Bancroft raved I gave the anathema Christ judges his own cause now I'm just going to say if you can understand what he's saying like I got some cookies in my car I'll give you because I, I read Luke I literally read Luke 3 probably 10 times trying to figure out what the heck he's complaining about and I can't figure it out okay I'm just saying but he's is he mad about it He's, re he's really mad about it, all right? Finishing the quote, the argument is entirely about accuracy of translation and the removal of inconsistencies in matters of chronology. Broughton has nothing to say of the English qualities of the translation. To judge from his remarks, such considerations are irrelevant. So in other words, this is in a book titled, this is in a book by... Um, Norton titled The History of the English Bible's Literature. So he's evaluating that Bible here, the King James from the standpoint of literature. So his comment here is that Broughton is more worried about translation and accuracy in matters of chronology than he is, does the Bible sound good as a matter of English literature? So you need to understand the point of view that Norton is coming from. All right. Now, in 2021, Kristen McFarlane published Biblical Scholarship in an Age of Controversy, The Polemical World of Hugh Broughton for Oxford University Press. In my estimation, this is the most current scholastic treatment of Hugh Broughton that you can purchase and buy. All right? The work represents the most updated scholarship on the life and career of Hugh Broughton. While we will be relying heavily on McFarland's work to frame our discussion of this important early critic of the A.V., so in order to top, tackle this topic, we will be covering the following points in this lesson, all right? The first point we're going to cover is Broughton's campaign for a new English Bible. Page three, we're going to be covering further thoughts from David Norton, some things that he said relative to this that we need to consider. And then we're going to look at the genealogies, Broughton's covert influence. In a, in a ironic stroke of historical reality, Broughton does end up influencing a section of the AV quite heavily, although most people won't know it because his name was not attached to it. And we'll get to that if we have enough time. Okay. So anybody got any questions or comments about the introduction? Mike, you look like you've made that one. Broughton seemed like he was kind of a troublemaker. For sure. That's probably why they kept him off the... I, absolutely, he's a troublemaker. He's a malcontent. He's sort of a um, got to have it his own way, my way, the highway type of person. Okay. So top of page three, Broke's campaign for a new English Bible. Well, we have told some of this story before in Lesson 157. It bears another look as a backdrop for understanding why Broughton was so critical of the AV when it was first published. McFarland begins her recounting of this history with the year 1593. Now, I should have brought my books. I have all these hard copies of these books. I bought them off of uh, early English books online. Look at the quote. In 1953, Broughton wrote a brief letter to William Cecil. William Cecil was the advisor of Queen Elizabeth, okay? Outlining his intention to start work on amending the Bishop's Bible and suggesting how this might take shape. Six scholars with Broughton at the lead, only changing what needed to be changed and adding short notes, tables, and maps at various places to supplement the main text. Broughton informed Cecil that he had been considering such a project for a while and that many noblemen, bishops, doctors, and even lay people had expressed the need for it. Given this encouragement and the urgency of the proposed, he thought that now was the time to set the wheels in motion. So notice the date on this, okay? So Broughton is writing William Cecil, a high-ranking official in the government of uh, Queen Elizabeth, in 1593. So this is 10 years before James is going to become King of England. Elizabeth is going to die in 1603. 
James is going to be coronated king in, of England in 1603. So Broughton is doing this 10 years before Elizabeth dies. He's writing a William Cecil and he's asking for consideration for this uh, revision of the English Bible. Nothing ever became of Broughton's 1593 request. Two years later, in June 1595, Broughton tried again to gain Cecil's approval for the project, only to be ignored yet again. Frustrated, in 1597, Broughton went public with the publication of an epistle to the learned nobility of England touching translating the Bible from the original. So, twice he tries through private correspondence to get the government, notably the crown, under Elizabeth's reign to sanction a project that he's proposed to revise the English Bible. In 1593 and 1595, he's ignored, and so he decides in 1597 to write a public uh, piece stating his thinking about all of this. Okay, so um, look at the quote now from McFarland, halfway down page three, or nearly halfway down page three. Another two years later, with no hint of any funds coming, Broughton made a drastic decision. Whereas previously he had been unwilling largely to tell, in, to tell in words what problems he saw in the English Bible for fear that it would be disgraced, which now we use, um, the continued uh, inaction of the bishops had prompted a change of heart. In late May 1597, therefore, Broughton wrote and published his, uh, his call to arms an epistle to the learned nobility of England touching translating the Bible from the original. The aim of this, well, I think it should say work, the aim of this work was to move the English nobility by which Broughton meant um, L, the ancient, uh, the ancient and, and good gentry of the land, so that's who he's addressing, to fund a new English Bible. Broughton claimed to be publishing this at the request of an unnamed lord who desired to know how best to execute a new translation. Like many of Broughton's claims, this is difficult to verify. I'm going to suggest to you that he possibly made it up. Um, he says that a lord wants this done and he doesn't name who the lord is. It's possible he's sort of making that up to try to uh, garner more interest in this being done, but I'm, I'm somewhat speculating there, I'll admit. Within this work, Broughton made some general comments on translation that are now among the best known of his ideas, such as his description of the need for consonant memory to translate the same often repeat words with the same sort. So in other words, should every Hebrew and Greek word only be translated with one corresponding English word? That's what he means by that. So he is not for a diversity or a variety in translation of Hebrew and Greek words. He thinks they should choose what? One word, One word and use that word only every time a given Hebrew or Greek word appears in the text. He also, however, made very specific remarks about the extent and nature of the scholarly knowledge which a good translator should have, including knowledge of the Maserah, a command of classical and rabbinic sources, and an understanding of the advantages and disadvantages in the use of the Septuagint as a translation, should say a translation aid. If may, I need to check if that should say translational. So in other words, who do you think is the only guy who meets all these criteria? Him. Okay? Does he meet his own criteria? <laughs> so you can kind of see what Broad's doing here. Finally, Broughton also offered a list of errors he had found in contemporary English Bibles and comments on who best to correct them. Many of these errors consisted of contradictory translations of different biblical verses, this is his thinking, which Broughton harmonized by carefully examining the syntax, grammar, and lexis of the original Hebrew and Greek text and retranslating accordingly. All right? So... Understand what's going on. Had he been shut down twice in requests for this project? So now in 1597, he goes public with this, and he writes a public uh, piece, and it included within this public piece is where he is listing what he believes to be errors in the Geneva and Bishop's Bibles particularly. Okay? Look at the next point on page 4. 
Broughton's epistle was not well received by its intended audience as once again no action was taken. So nobody does anything about it again. It's the third time now that nobody has, you know, paid any attention. Making matters worse, key figures such as William Barlow and Richard Bancroft, both key figures in the translation of the authorized version, openly mocked Broughton in a satire titled Master Broughton's Letters. Okay, so now, so we're still in the late 1590s, are two individuals that are going to be instrumental in the King James Bible Project going to now mock him in a satire called Broughton's Letters. Look at the quote. If any reaction was forthcoming from this first foray into the public arena, it was not positive. For only a month or so later, Broughton wrote a furious letter, letter to Cecil accusing Whitgift, who, had been the, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury at the time, of hindering his proposed translation and making it clear that he held the archbishop responsible for the continued production of English Bibles brimming with errors. Broughton was concerned, although, about the recep Broughton was concerned enough about the reception of his work in England that he even considered moving to Scotland, where he had been assured he would receive a warm welcome. Broughton was also involved in a controversy over the meaning of Christ's descent into hell with Thomas Bilson, William Barlow, and Archbishop Whitgift. So this was not the only controversy he had percolating, okay? He had this issue with the Bible. At the same time, he was involved in a controversy with Bilson, Barlow, and the Archbishop over the passage about Jesus' descent into hell. Okay, now I'm not going to expound on that. I just want you to know this is, this is a controversy. But look at the names here in this controversy. Bilson and Barlow. Bilson and Barlow, are they both important names in the production of the King James? Yeah. Okay. So he's got open arguments with Bancroft, Bilson, and Barlow, and the Archbishop about not only the English Bible, but also other points of doctrine. All right. It quickly became bitterly personal thanks to the publication of a satire against Broughton penned anonymously by Barlow and Richard Bancroft entitled Master Broughton's Letters. Although specifically, uh, although specifically engendered by the controversy over Christ's descent. So you should, what the, the picture that you should have developing here is, is Broughton through his activity regarding the English Bible and other doctrinal points is he establishing enemies that are going to end up being very instrumental in the production of the AV? So are these guys, particularly Bancroft, are they going to want this guy to have anything to do with the King James Bible? No. All right. So any questions so far? <clears throat> Halfway down page four. Broughton's epistle was also attracting another form of unwelcome and unanticipated attention. Roman Catholic apologists were using Broughton's strong arguments regarding errors in the English Bible as a club to beat Protestants. So this is another major problem, right? So he writes this piece in 1597 and he identifies what he thinks are errors in the English Bible. Does this now allow Catholics who believe there are errors in these Bibles to now use Broughton's work as a club to be Protestants with? Okay, look at the quote. Just as the English bishops seem to be united against him, the frankness of Broughton's an epistle to the learned nobility, that should be in italics, that title, an epistle to the learned nobility was beginning to attract the wrong kind of attention from Catholic controversialists who were keen to seize on Protestant admissions of corruptions in the English Bible. So now he's going to cause a proper problem for himself that he probably did not anticipate. So understand what's going on. Is he so mad that he didn't get any attention on this that he sort of blows a hole in his own ship? That's the way I see it, okay? The problem began when Thomas Wright of the English College at Douai, that's Douai, France. This is where the Roman Catholic Douai Reims Bible was produced, okay? In Douai, called upon Brown's uh, uh, quote, epistle dedicated to the lords of the council as evidence of the minor premise of his uh, syllogism proving that, quote, all Protestants were ignorant of Greek and Latin tongues are infidels. <laughs> Despite the ardent dismissals of Wright's comments by various Protestants, including Barlow, 
who asked how anyone could take seriously a man a man grown mad with his self lousing. So Barlow's saying Broton is mad, okay, and no one should take anything this guy writes seriously. Broton's work continued to be exploited for confessional ends. Later in this paragraph, McFarland states the following based on some documents in the Cambridge University archives. Intriguing, there is some hint that an epistle, that an epistle might in fact have made its way into the hands of the English translator, AV translators, despite this bad press. So in other words, there's some evidence in an archive at, at Cambridge that what Bancroft did is he attached a copy of Broughton's thing, uh, an epistle to the learned nobility, in a letter that he sent to the translating companies as an explicit example of what he didn't want them to do. You following that? So let's read the rest of that, okay? Intriguing, there is, there, uh, there is some hint that an epistle might in fact have made its way into the hands of the AV translators despite this bad press, as it seems likely to be the learned letter of Broughton's that Bancroft enclosed in one of his missives to the translators. However, on balance, though, an epistle to the learned nobility, also needs to be in italics, had been written with the aim of aiding the English church. In the years after its publication, it seemed to do rather more good for Catholic controversialists than for Protestants. So, by this time is Broughton sort of really paddling upstream. He's paddling upstream. Okay, he's alienated himself. He's involved in these controversies. His work has actually turned, has been turned and used against him now by Roman Catholics, which has caused another kind of a problem for him. Uh, and so things are not looking good for him at this point. Okay. So King James I ascended the throne of England in 1603 upon the death of Queen Elizabeth. I mentioned that earlier. Broughton saw this as a new opportunity to press his plans for a new English Bible. Quote, six years after the publication of an epistle to the learned nobility <clears throat> with the dissent, controversial, dissent controversy still raging and no hint of patronage for his translation project, the succession of James I in 1603 gave Broughton what he perceived to be a window of opportunity. He was always thought he would he always thought his scholarship would be better received in Scotland than in England, and with a Scottish king on the British throne, Broughton felt confident uh, that a change in his fortunes was imminent. This is shown in a letter entitled of amending the Geneva translation sent to James by Broughton soon after his succession and before 1604. In this, Broughton explained to James that many bishops and nobles had long wished for an improved version of the, Gen of the Geneva Bible and that even Anthony Gilby, who was one of its translators, had been, quote, most earnest to have his work, his word or work, I got to check that, that might be wrong, amended as well as briefly reiterating some of the general rules that Broughton had already mentioned in his epistle to the learned nobility, this letter also informed James that another work was soon to be printed, an advertisement of corruption, which would further reveal the gross errors in the text and notes of current English Bibles and urge him to take action in this matter. Whether Broughton ever did send this letter, or indeed whether James ever received it and replied, is a matter of speculation. But in any case, he would have no more support from James, either for his new Bible or his other projects than he had had for, from Elizabeth. So does James want anything to do with this guy? He didn't want anything to do with this guy either. All right? So anybody have any questions before we go on? What exactly was the dissent controversy translation didn't say that Jesus went to hell or that no it's a it's it's the it's a theological controversy about what that passage means did Jesus actually go to hell physically or did it doesn't mean something else that's what they were arguing about okay way too deep for us to get into now because we'll get way off course but so he's got the translation controversy brewing he's got the theological debate brewing he's got Catholics now who are using his epistle to the learned nobility to point out errors in the English Bible. All this stuff is going on and he can't get anyone to pay attention to him on what he wants to do with the Bible. Okay. 
So, after having been shut down at every turn to revise the English Bible, despite his ongoing efforts, Broughton was beside himself when he realized that James did sanction a revision of the Bishop's Bible at Hampton Court to be headed by Bishop Bancroft, his arch nemesis, and that he had been excluded from the project. So now is he really mad? Okay. Despite his ongoing efforts, 1605 translation of Ecclesiastes dedicated to Prince Henry, James's oldest son, Broughton's patience was waning, especially after he heard that the central role uh, Richard Bancroft had been assigned in the new translation commissioned by King James. Broughton's frustration that his old enemy's prominence in an enterprise so important to him is recorded uh, particularly vividly in a document written around 1609 entitled Rules Concerning the BB, that's short for Bishop's Bible, Bishop's Bible, Tran Bishop's, sorry, Translation of the Bible. Here Broughton described how he believed that Bancroft had wormed his way into the enterprise, manipulating James so that he would be allowed to appoint translators, um, I think this should say according to his according to his unlearned choice. So is he mad? He's pretty mad, all right. To minimize his heart to minimize his harmful influence, Broughton declared that he had designed this document to establish the thermida or rules uh, uh, should be laid down, showing what learning a translator ought to have. It is probable that Broughton was intending to publish this work, though he never did, even after Bancroft died in November 1610. Indeed, page 6, indeed publication of such a document would have been difficult, at least in England, given the extent and ferocity of Broughton's accusations of, about Bancroft within it. What began as a uh, neutral set of rules soon turned into a raging polemic outlining all of the reasons why Bancroft could not be trusted to produce a good translation. So is he pointing out why, Bancroft's, why he thinks Bancroft's an idiot? Okay, These include some um, intellectual reasons such as his um, commendation of Lively, that's another translator, uh, Edward Lively, uh, now deceased in 1599 Master Broughton's letters. Broughton worried that this was a sign that an English Bible produced under Bancroft would have many of the qualities he strongly disagreed with in Lively's translation of Daniel 9. Beyond this, Broughton doubted the sincerity of Bancroft's motives, holding him personally responsible for the fact that the faulty Geneva and Bishop's translation had held sway for so long perhaps most strikingly accusing him of burning copies of the 1609 defense of the concert. The most damning, however, and the most dangerous allegation Broughton made was that Bancroft was guilty of simony. Now, if you don't know what simony is, simony is the buying and selling of church positions. So, in other words, the only reason Bancroft is a bishop is because he purchased the position for what? Money. Now, is that a pretty serious allegation at that time? Bribery. Bribery, right? That he's not really fit to be a bishop, and that he bought his way into the episcopacy, all right? That he had effectively bought the bishopric of London in 1597 by paying Penelope Blount, Countess of Devonshire, Henry Cun, uh, Cuffey? Sounds good. Sounds good enough. And Gilly Merrick uh, to campaign for his appointment. For this reason, Broughton declared he would rather call Bancroft a buy shop than a bishop. Okay? Sounds like modern day social media. <laughs> yeah. So this isn't a document. Yeah. What does document mean? Because here's, the, here's my only issue. So some of these things are in publications where you have like a newsletter, that kind of thing, newspapers. But this, was this sent directly to these individuals or to the people that were above them? Or This was written but never sent, never published. It is in an archive. The written copy is in an, is in an archive in a British library. It's like a diary. Yeah. So well, more than a diary, but it's in a collection of personal papers. 
of Broughton that never got published. So, so not, I mean, the, like the one publication that specifically nailed Broughton as the whiny little, little weasel he is, it, that one was published Correct. somewhere. But, so all these responses are not necessarily with uh, uh, open links and social media kind of thing. So this is where it gets a little difficult to try and understand what was communicated and what was just a feeling. So I hear your point. What McFarland is tracing is the stuff found in the archives in these British libraries regarding what Broughton actually wrote, even though we, now I will say though that I think some of this he didn't need to write because everyone knew how he thought about it anyway because of other things that have been going on. But this particular piece had never been printed, okay? But it does exist in a British archive as something that Broughton wrote. So for whatever reason, he thought better of it. You know, it might be, you ever have a situation where you got a conflict with somebody and you just gotta like write all your thoughts out on paper and then after you've done that, you're like, wow, I probably shouldn't say this. <laughs> or this sounds really... He was saving it for opportunity. Or he was saving it when he felt like he could capitalize on it, okay? but. And the, she also makes the point, though, that there probably was not any publisher that would have even published it, even if even if he tried, because they would have wanted no part of publishing that a piece that went after the Archbishop Bancroft like this, because that publisher then could possibly be subject to some sort of penalties or what have you. So uh, McFarland did say that earlier up that this probably wouldn't have been published even if he tried, but. This is an insight, though, AJ, into what this guy actually thinks about what was going on, okay? So to call him a bishop than a bishop, that's where we left off. Although the rules remained unpublished, Broughton did print a brief sanitized extract from them in his 1609, a short oration of Bible translation, Bible's translation. We need to check that. I think that should say Bible, not Bible's. And they likely also inspired a, uh, his more polemical list of errors allowed uh, by Bancroft in his 1609, and he did publish this, a defense of the book entitled A Concert of Scripture. All in all, all, in all however, each of these did little more than repeat the comments Broughton had already printed in a, an epistle to the learned nobility and elsewhere, and they certainly made no positive contribution towards Broughton's attempts to gain traction for his idea about translation. So, again, I, I envision him, maybe he at some point he had some good ideas, I don't know, but he goes out into the water and he starts taking a shotgun and blowing holes in his rowboat, and at this point, is anybody listening to him? No. No, all right? So, by the end of 1609 and beginning of 1610, Broughton's writing was veering dangerously towards a pure ad hominem attack on the men involved in the King James trans in King James's in the King, excuse me, translation, with personal jibes against particular translators woven into his intellectual and theological arguments. Despite being completely shut out of the translation process by 1610, Broughton did not abandon his efforts to influence the final product. Quote, in his 1610, and I don't know how to pronounce this Latin title, he announced that if the bishops did indeed manage to provide a translation better than those he had produced of Ecclesiastes, Lamentation, Daniel, or Job, which, were then in, uh, which was then in press, he would not begrudge it. So if they happened to manage to do a better job than him, he would not begrudge it. That's what he's saying. Okay. Equally, if they failed to meet such standard, he would still be willing to do the job himself for a royal stipend. And again, in a further letter to James, written that same year, Broughton complained about the slow progress of the translation and the inadequacy of the chosen translators, but outlined once more his opinion of the learning a good translator ought to have and reiterated his offer to provide a better translation himself if provided an appropriate stipend. Is this guy a malcontent? Okay. With all this background, it should not be surprising to learn that when the AV was finally published in 1611, Broughton disliked the final product by Bancroft's committees. 
1611, Broughton published a censure of the late translation for our churches sent unto a right worshipful knight and uh, attendant upon the king. Page 7. Indeed, as well as Broughton's most famous critique of it, the 1611 censure, there exists also a more extensive document uh, dissecting the AV and demanding that the first edition be only for trial. So he's like, nah, this thing should just be a trial edition. This is what Broughton's arguing. This reveals that among Broughton's strongest objections to the new Bible was the clear influence of Lively's, that's one of the translators, a true chronology. The first Oxford company to whom the book of Daniel was assigned must have had this work before them as they translated. Evidence of his influence included many changes to the Bishop's Bible text of Daniel that were chiefly recommended in Lively's work. Now, let's make sure we understand. Broughton doesn't like Lively. Okay? Lively has already, he, they, two of them have already gone back and forth over translation issues in the book of Daniel. Many of Lively's translational choices end up in the King James Bible, which demonstrates did the company that, you, that, that revised the book of Daniel, did they have Lively's book in front of them? So this is going to make Broughton mad, okay, that they're listening to Lively and not to who? Yeah. Him. For instance, at Daniel 9.24, where the 1602 bishops translated, quote, to seal up the sins... Following the reading in the main text of the Hebrew, the AV instead put the Hebrews, uh, the Hebrew Bible's marginal reading to make an end of sins in the main text with the main reading to seal in the margin. Okay? So if you read that verse, grab your Bible, go to Daniel 9.24, just so you can understand what he's saying here. Okay, Daniel 9.24, I'll do my best to explain this to you. I, I, I have to admit, some of this stuff gets a little bit hard to follow if you're not actually looking at it. Daniel 9.24, okay? Notice what it says. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy holy people, upon thy people, and thy holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Okay. Now, what Broughton is mad about is, do you see in that verse where it says, to make an end of sins? Mm -hmm. See that? Yeah. He doesn't like the fact that, that that's what the King James translators put in the text when he felt the Hebrew said to seal up the sins. That's what he's mad about. So when you read this statement here from McFarland, let's start over. For instance, at Daniel 9.24, where the, two, where the 1602 Bishop's Bible translated to seal up the sins, following the reading in the main text of the Hebrew, the AV instead put the Hebrew Bible's marginal reading to make an end of sins into the main text, with the main reading to seal in the margin. So he thinks this is a terrible dastardly translational decision on the part of the King James Bible translators. This, reve this reveals of the readings that had been recommended by Lively on theological grounds that Christ merely uh, that for Christ merely to have sealed up sin rather than ending it would diminish the nature of a sacrifice. Broughton, however, objected <coughs> that the th that theot was a typo there somewhere. That theology alone was not reason enough to depart from the text uh, uh, as given in the Hebrew Bible. Another similar example occurred at Daniel 9.25 where Broughton was horrified to notice that the AV had followed Lively's interpretation of the verse against the precedent set by the Bishop's Bible. So look at the quote here. The first example is from the Bishop's Bible. To but Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince... This should, uh, there shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks and the street shall be built, built again and the wall. Now the King James in that verse says to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks the street shall be built again and the wall. 
As Broden noticed, whereas the placement of the colon in the 1602 Bishop's translation forced the reader to follow the traditional chronological interpretation of the verse as assigned by both the 7 times 7 and the 62 times 7 to the period of Jerusalem's rebuilding to Messiah, the placement of the semicolon in the 1611 AV pushed the reader towards Lively's interpretation enabling only the 7 times 7 to be assigned to the period for Jerusalem's rebuilding to Messiah. So he's, he's haggling over a colon versus a what? Semicolon. Semicolon. And he's saying if you do it the way Lively says to do it, you're messing the theology up of the verse. Okay. The problem I have with that is I don't care whether you punctuate that with a colon or a semicolon. It's obvious that you have to take both the 7 times 7 and the 62 times 7 to get to calculate when Messiah the Prince is going to show up in either rendering of the verse. So this is the kind of stuff that so this is the kind of stuff that that um, Broton is getting really mad about and causing him to you know uh, greatly dislike the King James. This meant that following the AV translation, the word Messiah at, the, at this critical point was difficult to interpret as a reference to Jesus Christ. Read the verse. Read verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks, comma, and three score and two weeks, colon, the street shall be built again on the wall even in troublous times. I read that and I have no idea what Broton's talking about. You guys follow what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so he has these very, very particular pet issues that he can't overlook. All right? Last paragraph. In seeing Lively's interpretation of Daniel embedded in the AV, Broton had one of his worst fears about the project confirmed that these same objections to the lively and elements of the authorized versions translations were repeated in his 1611 censure. However, despite Broton's complaints, his hopes that the AV might be recalled and a fresh translation commission were never fulfilled. Indeed, Broton, suffering by this stage from tuberculosis, returned to England in the year of its publication and died soon afterwards. <laughs> so, we have time to at least finish this point. Page 8. McFarland concludes here with comments regarding Broughton's desire to revise the English Bible as follows. Finally, <clears throat> from the perspective of the English Bible, this chapter has nuanced, and has nuanced and complicated some of the unusual commonplaces about Broughton's response to the AV by placing them within their long-term intellectual and political context showing how Broughton's criticisms of this translation were a fusion of theology and scholarly objections, as well as the culmination of years of intensive, intense debate and exchange, especially with Lively. As importantly as it has been suggested that the reason why such criticisms were never taken seriously by, by Broughton's contemporaries was not so much because of their intellectual quality as because of the particular way in which Broughton mer uh, merged such scholarly theological concerns with highly personal and vicious attacks on particularly prominent individuals like Bancroft. So in other words, if this guy had any legitimate points, was anybody really inclined to listen to him? No. no. So the most vocal objection to the publication of the King James is done by Broughton, who is mad at Bancroft, mad at Barlow, mad at Lively, mad at all, mad at the King for excluding him, and his attacks uh, uh, end up being sort of ad hominem, personal attacks, and whatever legitimate points he may have had are lost in all of the personal rancor and wrangling that he had with these people, okay? So, does anybody have any questions or comments before we move on? How would he feel about this Christian standard Bible? He wouldn't like it. <laughs> no. What you were reading, I'm reading, I don't. It's, you know, this He's, is so different. King James, uh, they yeah, changed this before, haven't they? Did they just change this in 2012 or something? Uh, I'm not all that familiar with the Christian standard Bible. I don't, I don't personally own one and haven't read it. Um, so... 
I don't know its history or when it was first published or when there may have been updates to it. Um, I would I would say that I think the Christian Standard Bible um, is obviously very different from the King James, both in language, in the form and style of the language, but I do think there are content differences uh, between the King James and a modern version that are that, that in my mind are significant. Now, but Broughton, his he he's in a different historical context. When the only thing that exists are translations of the Texas Receptus and the Hebrew Masoretic text, and he's complaining about both the Geneva Bible and the Bishop's Bible, and he thinks he should be the one that is only sufficiently credentialed to revise them, and then he gets mad when he's left off because of his... I saw somebody rubbing their eyes like a crybaby. Is that you? Yeah, I mean, he kind of is a whiner. Let's just say it that way. Okay. All right. Now, anybody got any questions or comments about that? All right, we got time at least to get the next point. Further thoughts from David Norton. All right. As good as McFarland's treatment of Broughton has been, we would be remiss if we did not also touch upon a couple points raised by Dr. David Norton in a history of the English Bible's literature. So let me just stop there just for a brief second. McFarland's treatment is far and away the best I've seen. And I've got other books at home that talk about Broughton in, in, in short little segments. Her entire book is about him. There are stuff she surveys from these uh, archives that I've never seen discussed anywhere else. And her, her book from 2021 is, is hands down the best thing available right now on the life and career of Broughton. But Norton did say some important things uh, also that we need to think about, okay? Uh, the airing Broughton gives to his ideas of uh, sweet ornateness of the scriptures must have served to remind the King James Bible translators that there was more to translation than meaning. But he never advocates for a rhetorical or poetic translation uh, and is absolutely clear that the duty of the translators is to be faithful to the meaning of the original as possible. All right? Now, Make sure we understand what's going on. Notice the title of Norton's book. A History of the English Bible as what? So his comments are directly about that, right? So Broughton is making all of these complaints. He never says that the English translation should be poetic. He never says it should be rhetorical. His main concern is accuracy. Okay, next paragraph. All he says of English style in the epistle which was published in 1597, is that a translation should have a mild style to win all to a good work, which is exasperatingly vague. English style is hardly even a minor matter for Broughton. The usual style, Geneva, will do because it is familiar, and he returns squarely to the issue of exactness. He judges a translator's duty to be, quote, to show the ring the, the ring meaning of old to show the ring meaning of old hid doings which by mistaking blame to the holy letters so <laughs> some of what he says is a little bit the bottom line there is he's more concerned about accuracy than he is what English style all right one of Rome's main criticisms of the AV was that the translators did not apply a principle of rigidity, or what Miles Smith calls in the preface, uniformity of phrasing or identity of words when rendering Hebrew and Greek words into English. Dr. Norton states the following regarding this point. Repetitions must be translated identically. This is what Norton's, this is what Broughton said. They must be translated identically. The King James translators especially excused themselves from doing this, but it became uh, principle of the it became principle of the RV. So Broughton said, if you have the word ecclesia, the Greek word ecclesia, every time the Greek word ecclesia occurs, you should translate it by the same English word. So it's, if it's church, it should always be what. Church. If it's congregation, it should always be what. You can't take ecclesia and translate it church and congregation. He says that's a no no. But that's what the King James translators did. They did not. I, they did not restrict themselves to an identity of phrasing. 
Miles Smith is very clear about that in the preface to the King James Bible. So this is one of Broughton's major complaints now about the King James Bible. Second, the preface um, concentrates on the translator's use of various words for a single word, and they may well be replying to Broughton when they said that. Okay? Dr. Norton offers the following summation of Broughton's approach to translating. Quote, At the back of this lies an equation between literal translation and eloquence in translation. The translation would be eloquent, not, now watch, not as English, but as Hebrew and Greek in English. Now, what does he mean? He means you should not set out to make eloquent English. The eloquency that is in the English should be directly commensurate and corresponding to whatever the eloquency is in the Hebrew and Greek. That's his point. Put another way, an English Bible should strive for accuracy in translation above eloquence in English. Any eloquence achieved in English should be commensurate with the eloquence found in the original languages. Because it's more important that it be accurate than eloquent what? English. This is what Broughton's main principle is. Norton concludes a section of chapter 3 regarding Broughton by pointing out that while his specific translational advice slash views were largely ignored, he did contribute to the intellectual atmosphere that gave rise to the AV. Quote, Much of Broughton's work was ignored. But however little the King James Bible translators responded to its details, to, to its detail, it contributed significantly to the intellectual atmosphere of the times by encouraging a reverence for the eloquence of the original without arguing for an equivalent eloquence, uh, eloquence excuse me, in English. But above all, by demanding that the whole truth and arguing that it could only be revealed through the closest attention to the words and syllables of the perfect originals. So his main idea is that you need to translate accurately from the originals and that any eloquency that is achieved in English is going to be secondary to the accuracy of the translation. All right? Any questions? You're using the King James Version today you're using? Yeah. The one they translated back in 16. So this is, the one that we have today in front of us is a, is a 1769 edition of the King James. So the King James went through some minor revisions, largely the updating of spelling of words and punctuation and, and some of those sorts of things that happened in the English language between 1611 and 1769. And so if you go to the store today and you buy a King James Bible, you are buying a 1769 edition. Okay. Okay. Uh, there's a lot more to that. That's just a simple answer. Mm. Okay. So I think we can, this last point, I think I can kind of make it quickly without reading all this. All right. Let's just look at a couple of the, the bullet points. So this is the genealogies, Broughton's covert influence. So in lessons 190, 191, and 192, we assessed the preliminary contents of the 1611. This included photographs and a brief description of the 36-page genealogy found in the uh, prefatory material of the 1611. At the time, we mentioned briefly that the genealogies were a combined effort of Hugh Broughton and John Speed. Okay, So up here I have a picture of this. This is from uh, Lesson 192. Here's the introduction to the genealogies. This is found in the King James. And then it begins on the next page with, a, with an ornate biblical genealogy of the different <laughs> figures and characters that are in the in the biblical narrative and record okay Broughton's name never shows up on this but he is very much involved with John Speed in producing this okay and for a variety of reasons that you could probably guess most notably his reputation as a malcontent when this eventually is published in the 1611 his name is not put on it even though he greatly was influenced and helped Speed lay all this stuff out. Speed was a cartographer. He was a map maker. And Broughton worked with him to create this ornate genealogy. This runs for 36 pages in, the sixth, in an original 1611. Okay? 
And Broughton was involved in this. Now you can read about this at the bottom of page 9. Uh, look at the last point on page 9. After considering the matter of the origin and creation of the genealogies, McFarland has concluded that they are much more than ornamental or decorative pieces. Okay? Look at the top, top page 10. Far from being purely ornamental or incidental, Broughton's genealogical work was a fusion of secular and sacred scholarship with significant implications for the relationship between the learned culture that produced them and the lay readership which, uh, for which they were designed. Between pages 86 and, one, between pages 86 and 108, McFarland leaves no stone unturned in surveying the history, theology, and working relationship between Broughton and Speed that gave rise to the creation of the genealogies found in the AV. While interesting, the details lay beyond the scope of this lesson. McFarland concludes this lengthy section as follows, quote, It is evident from these indexes how Speed and Broughton wanted readers to use their genealogies. They probably imagined that when readers of the Bible came across a new name or were confused by an apparent genealogical inconsistency, they would turn to their indexes, check the name in the table, find it in the genealogies with the reference, and thereby gain all the information necessary to situate that figure within the intricate networks of scriptural kinship. The AV's genealogies were intended to be anything but decoratively printed, but useless additions to the main translation. They were an apparatus to settle confusion and to be actively used, not passively admired. They were, in, they were uh, interventions against the outdated diagrams of the Bishop's Bible. They were meant to correct potential misapprehensions of the scripture at the same time as the scripture was being read. So look at my last statement and we're going to have to quit. Though the genealogies, through the genealogies, excuse me, Broughton covertly influenced the final product of 1611, even if he was not selected to work as a translator and detested the outcome. In my mind, this is one of history's little ironies. 36 pages in the 1611 are Broughton's produced genealogies with John Speed. His name is not put on them, but he is has he does have a presence in the 1611 edition through the publication of the genealogies. So we see in Broughton then the early criticism of the King James after it was published. Anybody got any brief questions? How long did they use the Geneva Bible? How long after this? No, before it. The, the, the Geneva New Testament was published in 1557. The complete Geneva Bible was published in 1560. Okay. There are additions. The King's printer stops printing the Geneva Bible in 1616. And then there are some later editions that are published at overseas presses in Amsterdam. But essentially, let's just say the middle of the 1600s, most people have switched from a Geneva Bible to an, to an authorized version. Okay. Any other quick questions? All right. Appreciate your attention. Next week, we're going to start talking about early sales of the King James. How did it sell in the book publishing market of the early 17th century England?